All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Linda Polgreen. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in Torrance, California, um, and an investigator at the Lundquist Institute, which is a nonprofit research institute on the Harbor campus where um, I conduct clinical research, translational research um, in osteopetrosis and some other uh, skeletal diseases, mainly in pediatrics, but a bit in adults as well. Uh, I really wish I could be there in person with you today. I apologize that I can't. I, if something came up with family that um, I had to take care of this weekend, but uh, instead I'm gonna record this presentation for you. Um, and when the presentation is done, then I think um, Marion will lead a discussion with you about the register results and, and uh, to try to get some of your feedback on this project. Um, it's really important to us that we um, make sure that this registry that I'm going to talk about in a minute here is capturing what's important to you all um, and that helps us really understand the full spectrum of osteopetrosis better. So first off, just um, patient registries. What are they? Why do we use them? Why are we? Why are they important? A registry, um, in terms of this versus a clinical trial, there's some very clear differences here. So a patient registry, um, although it is often listed on clinicaltrials.gov, which is where all the therapeutic clinical trials are, um, registries differ from treatment-based clinical trials in several important ways. One, the one and the most important way is that a registry does not investigate a new therapy. So registries are just collecting data. Um, they're not uh, treating participants with anything. So the registries are also based on the patient's actual experience, their current medical care. So again, there's not an intervention. It's just questions that are asked of individuals based on their own experiences. Uh, and another way to say that is that they're observational. So an observational study uh, versus an interventional study um, is what we would call something where there's a, something that's being done. Observation, we're just observing, collecting data uh, from the participants. And in almost every case, and, and for the case of the osteopetrosis registry, there's no cost to join. Um, then, and medical insurance providers are not involved at all either. Um, this is because this is something that you just do at home, really, um, on a computer where you enter data. You're not needing to go into a, a clinical center for uh, participating in registries. So that's what they are. So now why do we do them? Well, one of the really important things that registries offer us is the ability to identify patient priorities from a broad spectrum of the population. So you can imagine there's a, you know, a variety of people that probably don't go see their doctor very often. Some don't participate in clinical trials typically or observational in-person studies. And registries are a way to really try to capture the a more broad spectrum, um, more larger number of the population because of the ease of participating in a registry. We want to capture the knowledge gained from individuals who are living with the disease. So people who are living with osteopetrosis, what's it like on a day-to-day -day basis? How is the uh, disease impacting your life? Um, it gives us a better understanding of how diseases progress over time. Um, so since registries are relatively low cost and uh, we can have registries go on for many years and continue to collect data um, over many years to see how uh, the disease progresses in individuals. Can also explore variability in signs, symptoms, and progression of the disease within a patient population. And the reason for this, how it's different than a lot of in-person studies, again, is that you're just able to um, obtain data from a larger uh, group of individuals and thereby understanding the variability in the disease better. Um, sometimes there's what we call biases in terms of you know, reasons why people might participate in a study. And for example, often individuals who might be more affected by their disease might be more motivated to participate. On the other hand, if you're if people are uh, having such severe problems that it makes it difficult for them to go to a study center, that too might limit their participation. And so registries allow us to capture people on all ends of the spectrum of the disease and understand that variability. Another important thing to registries in one way that we're using the osteopetrosis registry is to establish patient reported outcomes. 
And what that means is just as it says that the patient is reporting, is answering a question about themselves, their experience, their disease, instead of a physician or research assistant technician uh, measuring something in that individual. And these types of outcomes are being recognized more and more um, by investigators, by the FDA, by NIH, as being really important in the design of clinical trials. And so we, for example, plan to use the data that we collect through the registry in the design of future clinical trials. So there would be um, surveys in there that patients would report their own experience um, during treatment or, or during a placebo that we could, we could use to look at potential um, effects of a new therapy. And so, you know, given all of this, this comes from this website I listed below from the NIH, that the data that's collected in these registries really seems to increase the probability that a treatment or cure may be developed for diseases and so and for, for that specific disease. And, and so I, I, I hope this helps convince you of the importance of registries in really moving uh, treatments forward. And I would say, um, and this again comes from this NIH website where they talk about registries is that NIH, are, excuse me, registries are particularly important for rare diseases. Um, and this is for a few reasons. So of course, the nature of a rare disease is that there's a small patient population. And that can sometimes make it very difficult to enroll enough people in a clinical trial. If you don't know where people are, can't get information to them that a clinical trial is ongoing, it makes it very hard to enroll. And so one of the um, uses of the registry that I think is really a benefit to both the patients and the researchers and clinicians is that um, it helps with recruitment. And so, you know, as people register in a, uh, into a online registry, like we have, when a clinical trial becomes available, um, if they've agreed to be contacted in the future about future research studies, we can then uh, share that information with everybody who's part of the registry. Um, another way is that at times, not always, but sometimes data from red patient registries can actually be used as what we call historic control data. And that just means that instead of using a, a standard design where some of the participants are treated with the new therapy you're testing, and others are given a placebo, which is uh, basically just um, the not the active medication, but just like a sugar pill. Sometimes people think of it that way. Um, sometimes instead of doing that, you can use data that has been collected in a patient registry as that control data. We call it historic control. So that's another way that registry data at times can be used. And in rare diseases, um, this gets at kind of that variability I mentioned, but there's often a poor understanding of the natural history of the disease and its progression without treatment. Um, and that again is just, there, there's so few individuals with it that unless you're able to really cast a broad net and reach a large number of people, it's hard to understand the full, um, the full uh, spectrum of disease and how it progresses over time. And without that, it makes it very difficult to look at how a new treatment might change that disease progression if, if you don't have a good understanding at baseline of what it looks like. Okay, so that was just a little bit of what registries are and, and why they are important. Um, now let's talk specifically about the osteopetrosis registry. Um, so this is a prospective collection of data that's directly from the patients and their caregivers that is uh, entered online. Um, this is funded through a NIH grant. Uh, Dr. Mike Ekans is the principal investigator on that. And um, so this is done in uh, collaboration with everyone there at Indiana. Um, and so the, the in-person natural history part takes place there at IU, and then this registry complements the in-person data by capturing, again, that more population-based uh, broad spectrum of the community. Um, I put a little a QR code down here if anyone is interested um, and hasn't uh, looked at the registry yet. You can scan this uh, on your phone, and it will take you directly to a website that has information on the registry. Um, it takes you actually to the consent form, which gives a lot of details about um, what the, the registry is doing and why. And if you're interested in participating, that would be the place that you can do that as well. 
So the aim of the registry is to obtain population-based data on the spectrum and rate of progression of disease in individuals with osteopetrosis and define the impact of disease on health-related quality of life. And so sometimes through this talk, I'll abbreviate that as HRQOL. Um, and the health-related quality of life comes from uh, surveys that participants fill out in the registry. And how this works, uh, data from participants with osteopetrosis, and although the majority of, of participants so far have autosomal dominant osteopetrosis, we are also collecting data on uh, individuals with autosomal recessive osteopetrosis as well. So it's not just specific to um, ADO2. But uh, participants with osteopetrosis, the data is collected using an online REDCap-based database. And so what REDCap is, is it stands for Research Electronic Data Capture. Uh, REDCap was developed by the NIH, one of the centers there called the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. So, um, or NCATS, and NCATS funds a variety of research centers around the United States and uh, gives us access to this uh, very user-friendly um, database called REDCap. And so if you participate in the registry, you'll see REDCap, um, is the, the logo that you'll see there. So what's nice about this is individuals can go using that QR link I, I had shared a slide before, can go into this database and, sorry, hold on, I've got a sound issue, I believe. Um, okay, they can uh, go into the database and consent then is provided electronically. Um, and with once the consent is given electronically, um, then the diagnosis of osteopetrosis need to be needs to be confirmed by one of the investigators. Uh, just one second. Okay, I apologize. I think the sounds back. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody who is in the registry actually has osteopetrosis. And so unfortunately, sometimes with something. Um, like this that is purely online, you can get individuals um, who who don't actually have the disease you're studying. And so that's why we need to confirm this by either uh, obtaining an x-ray report or x-ray image or genetic testing to confirm the, the diagnosis of osteopetrosis. So once that's done, then um, the participant is sent a link via email uh, to enter their medical data and complete quality of life surveys. And just to give you an idea um, of what this looks like, this is uh, the consent, beginning of the consent form. I just kind of screenshotted the first part that uh, if you click on that QR link again, this is what will pop up and it gives you the details of the study. And then the participants will say they agree to participate or they don't, if they voluntarily agree to participate. Once we, as I mentioned, confirm the diagnosis, then they get the link to the surveys. And this is the sort of screen that they would then see when they click on that survey. And it's pretty user-friendly. Um, you just click on the, you know, begin survey for the first one. And when you do that, it'll pop up a question and it's just, um, different questions related to these different areas um, of anxiety, depression, fatigue, peer relationships, friendships, pain, both how it interferes and how intense it is. Um, so a, a variety of questions related to those topics then would follow. And this is done then every six months. So every six months, an uh, email reminder is sent out uh, to participants asking them to come back into the database, update their medical information, all the information that I'll list here, um, and answer those surveys again. And in that way, we can get some prospective data collected um, as well and look at how the disease progresses over time. So what else is asked besides those um, the, the quality of life topics 
Um, we, uh, again, mentioned we get the diagnosis. Um, we find out what caused people to suspect osteopetrosis. So this gives us, from a clinical perspective, a better understanding of what are the presenting features of osteopetrosis. And then we document the genetic testing results. And this allows us to, in the future, look for differences in disease severity, rate of disease progression, response to treatments, things like that, based on the genetic testing results. We'll ask family history, uh, including we want to know what other family members have osteopetrosis. Go through treatment history. Uh, so we ask individuals to enter whether or not they've had bone marrow transplantation, uh, whether they've been treated with certain medications such as calcitriol or vitamin D or interferon gamma, and then list any other medications that they are currently taking. We go through the medical history, asking people to uh, tell us how many lifetime fractures they've had, have they had any blood transfusions, uh, history of osteomyelitis or current osteomyelitis, and hospitalizations. So again, trying to pull out some of the, the key things that we know are associated with osteopetrosis, but also keeping it a bit open-ended for people to really just type in what problems they've been having and what information they want to share with us. And finally, uh, we look for, we collect surgical history as well as bone density testing results if they're available. And so now I'll just talk about what we've found so far. Um, I'll share just some what we call baseline data. So this is from the first um, participation in the study that these people have had. So some have answered surveys more than one time, but so far I'll just, I'll just share the, the information from the first time that they entered data. So we currently have 34 participants with autosomal dominant osteopetrosis. That's who I'll share the data on here today. Um, and of those 34, uh, nine are less than 18 years of age and 25 of them are more, greater than or equal to 18 years. Uh, you can see we've got a wide range of age span. Um, so the in parentheses here shows you the range for each of these categories, but overall the age ranges from five years up to 84 years. The age of diagnosis of osteopetrosis ranges from zero to 65 years. We have predominantly um, a, a higher number of females than males, um, at least in the over 18 group. Um, and a little lower than would be expected in the under 18 group. But overall, um, you know, we'd expect this to be about 50-50, but we're getting more participation from females than males. And in terms of race, we see uh, kind of unexpected there too, that the, the, main, the majority of individuals that are participating report as being uh, white, so 97%, 3% black, and, and that's it. So we really have not, for some reason, um, been able to enroll a wide spectrum in terms of, of race and, and, um, and, and gender in the registry at this point. So something to discuss maybe at the end of the uh, presentation here, how we might improve that or why that might be. Um, we collect lifetime fractures, as I mentioned, and here too, you can see this real wide spectrum of disease that we are capturing. So uh, individuals report anywhere from zero to 96 lifetime fractures. And then in terms of the um, results of the impact of disease on quality of life, so this would be that health-related um, quality of life, um, this, there's a few different ways we look at this. There's two different surveys that um, I'll share the data with you on today. This is one survey called the RAND36. Um, this survey is only in adults, so every, all the data you see here is just from individuals 18 and older. Um, and just to orient you to this figure, what we have are these different um, quality of life measures that are included in the survey. So you've got just physical function, you've got physical health and the role limitations that has. So that means um, that how does the physical, uh, your physical health related to in this case, osteopetrosis, how does that limit the, the things you need to do on a daily basis as, for example, at your job or as a friend or a parent or, um, you know, a coworker? How, how does your physical health impact those, those roles that we take on each day? And for emotional health, similarly, how does the emotional impact of the disease impact those same 
roles that you take on on a daily basis. It also looks at energy and fatigue, emotional well-being, social functioning, pain, and then a general health measure that uh, kind of just pulls it all together. And up here, the black dot here is the healthy control population. So this would be um, where on average are people in our society, I believe this is from a U.S. healthy population, their scores would be. And lower means worse health, higher means better health. So what stood out to us here was that although you see much lower scores for physical function, uh, physical health and role limitations, um, you don't see uh, any real difference from the general population for emotional well-being. Um, yet we do see a decrease in the effect of emotional health on role limitations. And we weren't sure, honestly, how to interpret that. And so that's something maybe for the discussion after the results are presented here as well, of what that, what that might mean and why we see that difference there. You can see low levels for energy and fatigue, um, and as we expected, just based on what patients' families tell us, um, low levels, meaning higher amounts of reported pain in this population as well, compared to the general population. So obviously, some significant disease uh, impact on quality of life using this score, the scale, the RAN36. Okay, now another way that we look at quality of life is using a survey called the PROMISE 57. And this uh, survey comes from the NIH, and it has uh, parents reporting for their young children. And then as children um, get older, this picture, um, so children who are um, 8 to 17, they report on themselves. So where you see child teen down here, that's the child reporting answering questions for themselves, parent report, the parents report the answer the questions for their child. And then of course, adult for 18 and over the adults report their own answer their own survey questions. And for this outcome, um, on the left side here, we've got lower numbers mean worse health, higher mean better health. But on the right side, it's flipped. It's a little, a little tricky. So I tried to label this well, but so on the right side, higher is worse health, lower is better health. And the line here, the solid line, is the average for the U.S. general population. And anything that goes more than five in one way or the other from that is considered clinically important. So we don't talk about statistics here, but just what is a clinically important difference? And it would be, again, anything that falls outside these dotted lines. And so for this uh, survey, the PROMISE survey, this looks at the ability to participate in things and the overall physical function. And you can see for this one, um, it, it pretty much falls in the normal range for ability to participate in life in general. Um, and then for physical function, we see it pretty much average for the children and adolescents, but for the adults, they're dropping below this minimal clinical difference down towards the worse health uh, compared to the general population. So similar to what we found on the RAN36. Looking at other symptoms, so this is anxiety, fear, depression, sadness, fatigue, and pain. Here too, we can see, and again, this now higher numbers means worse health, lower means better health. And across the board here, we see much better numbers in the uh, parent report and child teen report compared to adults. So by adulthood, it does seem, unfortunately, that at least for anxiety and fear, fatigue and pain, we're seeing clinically significant uh, impact of osteopetrosis on those outcomes. But for depression and sadness, uh, we really don't see any impact of the disease on average uh, on that outcome shown here in green. So uh, to summarize, we have enrolled 34 individuals with autosomal dominant osteopetrosis in the registry. And unfortunately though, uh, only 14 have completed follow-up surveys. So I showed you the baseline, their initial data today, uh, in part because we don't have a lot that have filled, up the, filled out the follow-up data. And so that's uh, something that I'd really like to get some feedback from the group on how we might improve um, those numbers and motivate people to 
come back and keep filling out uh, the surveys, updating their medical data um, every six months or every 12, if every six seems too frequent, um, but just some advice on how to improve that. In addition, predominantly white females are participating in the registry. So there again, uh, we need to really talk about how can we uh, make the, the um, participant population more diverse. We have got a wide variability of disease severity in the, in the registry data, which is good. That was a goal of, of the registry. For example, uh, lifetime fractures ranged from zero to 96. Um, and on average, looking at the uh, quality of life data, osteopetrosis does significantly limits physical function and has a negative impact on quality of life and general health. Um, and unfortunately, pain, anxiety, and fear are very common in the participants in the registry. And so I just like to say thank you. Uh, and, and for those of you that have participated, thank you very much for doing that. We very much appreciate it. Um, I look forward to hearing back from um, the Indiana group on the discussion about the results and how we might uh, improve the registry as well. Um, and I hope to join you all in person next year. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.